we will be hearing from Dr. Mitchell Miglis. And Dr. Mitchell Miglis will be talking about long COVID and its relationship in terms of burden and impact of autonomic neurological symptoms. And uh, Dr. Miglis is from the Department of Neurology and also has a background in sleep medicine as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Mitchell Miglis from the Department of Neurology at Stanford University. And for the next 15 minutes, we'll be discussing dysautonomia in long COVID. So as we know, the autonomic system is an incredibly complex system that innervates uh, most of the organs in our body and controls the automatic functions we don't have to think about. Uh, there's three components that we can divide the autonomic system into, sympathetic or fight or flight, parasympathetic or uh, rest and relaxation, and a third system, uh, which is comprised most of the innervation of the autonomic system, which is the enteric component. So these nerves innervate heart, uh, blood vessels uh, that line our uh, vascular system, um, nerves that line the vascular system, the gastrointestinal, genital urinary, sweat, pupillary function. Uh, so it's an incredibly di di diffuse set of nerves. And we often divide the functions of autonomic control into the central system or preganglionic in the brain and spinal cord and the peripheral or postganglionic peripheral nerves. You'll hear this term a lot thrown around dysautonomia. What is dysautonomia? Well, it's not a specific diagnosis. It's really a descriptive umbrella term that encompasses all forms of autonomic dysfunction, but it's not a disease. Um, however, more specific diagnoses that can fall under this umbrella include postural tachycardia syndrome, or POTS, orthostatic hypotension, or OH, recurrent neurally mediated syncope, or NMS, and autonomic neuropathies, which are caused by a diffuse set of diseases. Uh, ones that we commonly see include diabetes uh, and immune or inflammatory causes, which uh, includes COVID. How common is autonomic dysfunction in long COVID? Well, it's not really clear. There are several studies. Um, one of the studies we performed, in, in uh, which uh, surveyed over 2,000 patients with long COVID, demonstrated that about two-thirds of them have autonomic symptom scores suggestive of moderate to severe autonomic dysfunction. And the important point to take home here is that there was no difference in the severity of the autonomic dysfunction when we stratified for patients that were hospitalized and those that weren't. So even mild infection that does not require hospitalization can lead to a pretty profound autonomic disability. If we do the numbers here at the time uh, of these calculations, this, this would um, uh, translate to about 7 million people in the U.S. that are affected by autonomic dysfunction with, with long COVID. And of course, all the reports in the news um, around these diagnoses, which, which suddenly became you know, new to people. These were things we were seeing in autonomic medicine for many years, um, but were, were really brought to the forefront with, with media reports of both POTS and small fiber neuropathy and long COVID to really wait, raise the awareness of these disorders. So when you're seeing patients in the clinic and you're suspecting an autonomic component or autonomic dysfunction in, in long COVID, first thing you want to ask about are symptoms of what we call orthostatic intolerance. And this really means symptoms that are worse when standing and relieved with sitting or laying flat. Lightheadedness and dizziness are most common. However, there can also be vision changes, uh, fatigue, nausea, uh, cramping, chest pain, shortness of breath is common. Um, and if you're, if you're you know, getting a lot of these symptoms from your patients, what you really want to ask them is, are they worse when you stand? Do they get better when you sit down or lay down? And so if you, if you elicit the history of orthostatic intolerance, then you want to see if you can get a more specific diagnosis from what's causing that. Um, the three conditions that I mentioned earlier, OH, POTS, and, and neurally mediated syncope, um, can really be diagnosed based on history and a simple stand test in the office with a blood pressure cuff. So orthostatic hypotension is a sustained drop in blood pressure by at least 20 points systolic within the first three minutes of standing. Um, POTS, there is not an abnormal drop in blood pressure 
However, there's an increase in heart rate of at least 30 beats in adults, and that number is going to be at least 40 beats per minute in adolescence uh, on standing. Okay, neurally mediated syncope, patients do not have to have orthostatic intolerance every time they're standing, but they get a sudden onset of symptoms, which can lead and often does lead to fainting. Okay, and neurally mediated syncope is not necessarily pathologic. It's a reflex that can happen to any of us, but patients with POTS and patients with OH are more likely to have fainting spells and more likely to have neurally mediated uh, syncopal reflexes. And this does increase in, in COVID. Um, so if you have a patient that faints, it's not necessarily pathologic. You really wanna ask about uh, POTS and you really wanna assess for, for OH as well. So we do tilt testing at Stanford. This is not available in most centers. Um, if you did a tilt test in POTS, this is what you'd see. On tilt up, you see that the blood pressure does not drop, right? So there's no orthostatic hypotension, but you see the heart rate go up significantly. And this patient went up by 65 beats. So um, you have at least a gr uh, greater than 30 beat increase. The patient is very symptomatic um, and the symptoms are chronic. So in this case, we can diagnose this patient with POTS. And this was actually the first case report of POTS uh, in the world after COVID, you know, that we published um, a nurse um, who developed POTS uh, within a month of her COVID infection, thankfully improved, uh, and she's doing fine now. But the importance really is there's no orthostatic hypotension. You can see an increase in blood pressure. We can see hypertension, but there's no hypotension. If there's hypotension, that's orthostatic hypotension. That's a different disorder, okay? Um, but you don't need a tilt test to, to diagnose POTS or OH. Uh, you, can, you can either check the blood pressure and heart rate in the office, first laying flat, and then have the patient stand in place and check the numbers every minute for three minutes. Um, we have this log that you can download online here. I've included the website. You can give to your patients. We do this all the time with our patients. Have them fill it out at home once a day for a week, log the symptoms, send it back in. If you see orthostatic tachycardia with symptoms of orthostatic intolerance, and those symptoms have been present for at least three months without another explanation, you can diagnose POTS. You don't need a tilt table test. Of course, POTS uh, is a syndrome, and the tachycardia and the lightheadedness is just one small piece of that. Um, there's all these many other symptoms. And if you look at this list, these are really the same symptoms that most patients with long COVID have. Um, so they're incredibly complex patients. It really takes a village to treat them. Um, but, uh, you know, just be aware that the, the lightheadedness and the tachycardia is just the tip of the iceberg. If you do a physical exam in a patient with POTS, it's most of the time going to be normal. You might see signs of venous pooling when they stand in the legs, they turn red or purple. And you should just keep in mind that joint hypermobility is incredibly common in these patients. And we see it in about a third of patients with POTS. And you, you should get familiar with what's called the Baton scale, which, which I've included here. And this simple sort of 30 second physical exam set of maneuvers, you can grade the hypermobility. And if they're in a scale of five or more out of nine, um, that's suggestive of joint hypermobility. That doesn't mean they have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. There's a more extensive checklist for that. Um, but it might clue you into maybe an underlying predisposition. Um, this hasn't been published, but we're seeing in some of our data that the presence of hypermobility uh, increases someone's risk of getting long COVID by two to maybe threefold. So it may be a risk factor in this disease. Of course, we know that infection, even before COVID, was the most common reported trigger of patients' POTS. About 40% of patients report a trigger after infection. Um, other triggers include surgery, pregnancy, vaccination, concussion. Um, so, you know, the cause of POTS is unclear, but um, a lot of this association with certain triggers suggests that it might have an immune mediated mechanism. How common is it in long COVID? Of course, there are many studies, different methodology. Um, studies have reported rates from up to like 80%, which is probably too high. I think the number is probably somewhere between 10 and 30 percent. Um, probably the best study here um, showed a, a, a rates of around 30 percent of patients that that had heart rate criteria that met POTS 
um, a very good epidemiological study um, showed that patients who had COVID had a five times greater risk of, of getting POTS than those who did not have COVID. Um, and this risk had also increased slightly with the COVID vaccine, about a 1.3 times greater risk of POTS after the vaccine. But this really emphasizes that um, as in all sort of vaccine, potential vaccine mediated um, illnesses, the risk of getting that illness with the actual infection is much, much greater than with the vaccine. So we, we always encourage our patients to get vaccinated. So again, many potential causes of POTS. Um, we could go through this, uh, this slide. It might take the whole lecture to go through this slide, but important things to point out are there are studies suggesting inflammatory markers are increased, potentially autoantibodies. There's association with small fiber neuropathy. Um, so we always ask our patients about that. There's association with connective tissue laxity, hypermobility, and there's also associate, association with mast cell dysfunction. dysfunction. So you do also want to ask your patients, have they developed new allergies, food or environmental allergies? Do they flush easily? Do they get hives? Because those symptoms, you know, can be treated pretty, um, pretty, pretty non-invasively, you know, with, with over-the-counter antihistamines to start. Uh, and then there's some other potential prescriptions you can use. So small fiber neuropathy, um, symptoms of this would be typically pain, burning, stabbing, uncomfortable tingling, sometimes numbness. Um, it can be in strange places. It can be patchy, torso, even the face or even the, the, the mouth. Um, so uh, patients with POTS, we always ask them, you know, if they develop new pain or, or strange sensations in their body. Uh, and the diagnostic test that's most sensitive and specific for this is a skin biopsy. Um, that neurologists can do. It's very non-invasive. We can do it about 15 minutes. Um, we do a small punch biopsy, and then we stain that biopsy for the the nerves in the in the epidermis, and um, and and there, those nerves are counted under a microscope. And if there if there's a reduction in the epidermal nerve density, we can diagnose the patient with small fiber neuropathy. If they are diagnosed with that, then we want to rule out all the other potential causes, you know, which I've included here, mostly vitamin deficiencies, diabetes, other autoimmune diseases. Um, but if you do see this in a patient with long COVID, um, just be aware it is fairly common in patients with long COVID and POTS. We're seeing this in about a third of our patients that we biopsy. It's not really clear in the general long COVID population that doesn't have POTS and those studies are, are being currently done. How do we treat POTS? Incredibly complex topic, but you know, just an overview, you first wanna start with non-pharmacological therapies. You wanna increase fluid and salt. So this means generally two to three liters of water and at least a couple teaspoons of table salt daily. Um, you can get this salt with electrolyte solutions as well. The goal is at least five grams up to 10 grams of salt uh, daily, sodium chloride daily. If patients are able to tolerate exercise and they don't have a lot of post-exertional malaise, we want to gradually push the exercise. But if they start crashing and they have a lot of PEM, you really want to back off on that. And there'll be other talks on that in this, uh, in this, um, this CME. Um, most patients require medications. And once we expand the volume with fluid and salt, then we want to try and rate control, bring the heart rate down, usually with low-dose beta blockers like propranolol. Sometimes we'll use a Vabradine. And if they have low blood pressure, we'll either use mitogen or fludrocortisone to get that blood pressure up. Um, Peridostigmine can also be useful. It's also helpful if patients have delayed GI motility to use that uh, to increase the motility. If they have symptoms of sympathetic uh, hyperactivity, uh, which a lot of them do. We can use these central alpha blockers like guanfacine or clonidine uh, or even carbidopa uh, either during the day or at bedtime to decrease those hyperadrenergic surges and then also treat mast cell symptoms if they're present, um, often with a combination of H1 and H2 over-the-counter uh, antihistamines. A common combination is Zyrtec and Pepsid uh, for that. Immunomodulatory therapies, a lot of patients ask about IVIG. 
only if there's very strong suspicion of an autoimmune mechanism. We like to see some kind of autoantibody as well that's present um, before we prescribe that, but that can be a treatment for some patients. And then also the anti-inflammatory medications that um, Dr. Bonilla might discuss, like lotus naltrexone and aripiprazole. Um, vagal nerve stimulation and transcranial magnetic stimulation might also be useful. Uh, and antivirals, we've had one negative study with Paxlovid, but other studies are ongoing. So in conclusion, autonomic dysfunction is extremely common. If you have suspicion of that, you want to check orthostatic vital signs, and you can do this at home with your patients with this log. Be aware that POTS is the most common autonomic disorder that we see, but also be aware of small fiber neuropathy, and that may not follow your classic length-dependent neuropathy pattern. Don't be afraid to treat these patients. You can significantly improve quality of life, increase fluid, increase salt, uh, tell them to start a graded exercise program, try propranolol, you know, experiment with alpha blockers, um, antihistamines. So don't be afraid to treat these patients. Um, and uh, we have a lot of them, so we need your help. So thank you.